In addition to his work in education, he is also known in the independent hip-hop and soul music scene for his hip-hop production. Known as producer and DJ, previously known as Jay Rawls, he first gained prominence on the national scene after his work with one of my favorite albums, (laughs) with Black Star, uh, a hip-hop group comprised of Most Def and Taleb Kweli. Rawls contributed production on Brown Skin Lady, which you all heard tonight, and Yo Ye, Yo Yeah, which placed him on the map among independent hip hop producers. The album Most Def and Talib Kweli, A Black Star, was critically acclaimed as one of the best albums of 1998 and was a major force in the late 1990s underground hip hop explosion. Rawls has also worked with artists such as Del the Funky Homo Sapien, Domo Genesis, I Future, Capital Steve's Pro Era. Beastie Boys, Slum Village, El Desensei, Sadat X, Count Base D, Grand Agent, uh, North Carolina own, own Ninth Wonder, J Live Us 3, John Robinson, JR, and King Combs, the son of Sean P. Diddy Combs. He's released three solo albums and contributed to the Neo Soul movement, producing the likes of Aloe Black, Eric Roberson, Dudley Perkins, and many others. Using jazz and hip hop, coining the term jazz hop. Rawls' 2006 work with the Liquid Crystal Project led to national acclaim. His Columbus-based production company and record label continues to make an impact on the national hip-hop scene. And he is in demand as a DJ for top clubs and private functions throughout the country. Along with John Robinson, his partner in the group JR, Rawls published his first book titled Youth Culture Power, YCP. The book Part of Christopher Emden's Hip Hop Ed book series via Peter Lang Publishing aligns with Latson Billings' theory of culturally relevant, relevant pedagogy, with a look into Rawls and Robinson's theory of youth culture pedagogy, YCP. YCP details the many ways that youth in marginalized schools identify with hip hop culture, as well as the ways that culture can be used as a tool and asset in education. What sets this book apart is that Rawls and Robinson have created an album to accompany the book. The album consists of J. Rawls produced jazz infused hip hop tracks over which John Robinson rhymes on the state of educating in a city youth. Each chapter co- corresponds to a track from the album and throughout the book are scenarios of application in various situations to which all educators can relate. To our network of teachers, both nationally and internationally, and without further ado, I present to you our and leader for this session, Dr. Jason Rawls. We are honored to have you with us tonight and look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rawls. And uh, happy 50th anniversary of hip hop. Indeed. Mike, thank you so much for the, the warm introduction. Uh, check, check, one, two. Y'all hear me okay? <laughs> We're in the building. We can hear you. Man, so listen. So here's what I'm looking at. The Los Angeles Unified School District is in the building <laughs> they are deep in yeah. here i feel like i'm yeah. i'm in la i'm about to I'm about to head on out and listen yeah. going to the beach yeah. or something um yes. welcome we, everybody we, <laughs> we have a large la usd crowd and again everyone please continue to um drop your uh, your questions your thoughts and your ideas in the managed q a chat um yeah yes go yeah. ahead we'll keep that active yeah. thank you sir Indeed, the chat is the chat is down for the moment. So, um, not uh, hopefully you guys got to check out my TED talk, got to read uh, that first chapter of my book, Youth Culture Power. Um, but to be real honest with you, it don't matter because the way hip hop is, the the mindset, the mentality of hip hop, nothing can stop us. And that's just that's how we're gonna do it today. So we don't have a chat. So everybody, so you know, y'all keep saying there's no chat. Nope. There's no chat, so we're going to make the Q&A the chat, cool? Because here's how it works. I'm a hip-hop dude. I'm, I'm hip-hop, you know. First of all, let's give props to hip-hop for 50 years. Um, you know, this amazing culture has touched lives all over the country, all over the world, and, and I'm just excited. So here's how I, I operate, y'all. I'm going to be real honest with y'all. I like response. See, I'm a hip-hop DJ, so I like call and response. So Y'all can put in questions all through the day, all through the through the whole thing. We're going to talk. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to have a good time. And we're going to learn something along the way. So hip-hop and youth culture is pedagogy. And um, I, I never like to, like, start off and, and just go right into it. I would like to give you a little bit of background of who I am 
just so you know who you're dealing with. Um, and, and I know he introduced it, but I, I want to tell you again myself, right? So um, K-12, higher ed for two decades. And here's the thing. When I started teaching, I didn't choose teaching at first. I went to college for business. Now, think about this. I'm in college for business. I just know, I just know that I'm going to become a computer programmer and make a whole bunch of money. And so I'll go, I go to do that, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is boring. <laughs> it wasn't doing it for me. And so my cousin was like, yo, you should be a teacher. She looked at me and looked at how I acted and said, you should be a teacher. Now, ain't that crazy? How many of you, somebody told you, you should be a teacher, right? And so it just really, it just really made me think like, okay, let me see like how I can do this. And so when I first got into teaching, like I mentioned, like I mentioned, I did not um, share with my students who I was and I kept that secret. And what I realized was that my students, uh, I wasn't giving them my authentic self. And once I started to change that up and be who I was and, and let my hip hop self be me, then my students related to me and it made more sense. It, and it really started to work. So I was real, real happy about that. And, and it just started to make a difference. So that's when I knew education was for me. So got my master's in 2006, doctor in 2017. And, um, and then I went on to uh, co-author the book with my brother, John Robinson, Youth Culture Power. And then our second book is How Can I Move the Crowd? And Youth Culture Power talks about um, basically um, using teacher-student relationships to increase student engagement. And it's important because that's, that's kind of the whole point. That's what we're here to talk about today. Um, and with the advent of this book, I was able to um, create a program at Ohio University. Um, it's called the HOPE program, Hip Hop Ohio Patent Education. And in this program, I was teaching teachers how to incorporate, well, future teachers, pre-service teachers, how to incorporate hip hop culture and aesthetics and youth culture into their pedagogy and into their curriculum. So uh, that was a very successful program for the two years I was able to do it. But then Ohio State saw what I was doing. They swooped in, gave me the tenure track offer. And now we are creating the first hip hop studies program in the country that I am aware of here at The Ohio State University. So we're working on it to where students will be able to minor in hip hop, um, hip -hop studies, both from a practitioner standpoint and also from a cultural standpoint. So uh, we'll, we'll move on like that. Uh, so I know there are a lot of questions in there. Um, some of the specific questions I'm going to wait to answer, but I do want to get to them. So hopefully Mike is writing them down or he'll come back or you guys will put them back in. Um, but let me, let me get into it a little bit. So let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to talk about today. So I want to first start out with youth culture. I want to talk next about hip hop culture, because if you think about it now, hip hop is pretty much youth culture. Right, and it has become that over these 50 years. And so in my mind, it started to make sense of how do we use hip hop and youth culture to build relationships with students so that we can teach them, right? Um, and it's not becoming their friend. Make sure, I wanna make sure I say that. It, I'm not telling you to go out and be the student's friend. You're not their friend. It's about building relationships and those connections so that you're able to teach them and reach them. That's what we need to do, right? So some of us may need to change our perspective, and that's what I call a hip-hop mentality. So that's what we're going to get into. So I need some help in the chat. I need y'all to get on here in the chat. Here we go. All right. I want to talk about perspective. Before we do anything else, I want to talk about perspective. I know LAUSD is in the building, so I need y'all to go right now. What do you see? Go ahead and type it in the manage Q&A. What do you see on this picture? Type it in there. Tell me what you see. Give you a second. What does this picture look like to you?
Interesting. I love these different perspectives, right? A girl with a beret, a trans, woman with the hat. Notice how you all are seeing. <laughs> Somebody said the Andre 3000's hat. I love it, right? <laughs> notice, notice how you're all seeing different things, right? All right, keep that in mind. Let's, let's see what else you see. Let's go here. Let's take it to school, right? Because we're teachers. We're educators. What do you see right here? What's the perspective? What do you see with this? Uh-huh. What do you see? What do you guys see? Is this your class right here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think they're getting here. This may not be your class. Yeah, this oh, may yeah, not be I see your class. Yeah, the responses are coming in. Kids ready to learn. Students ready to learn. Engagement. Students ready for direction. Kids wanting to learn. Sweet babies ready to see what I'm saying. We see them sweet babies, right? Let's get it. I see you carefree, my man, Will. I got you. Uh, leaders. I like that, Griselda. Leaders ready to learn. Uh, a first grade class. Attentive. Okay. You seeing some things, right? So we're seeing something. Okay. Everybody's got their own perspective of what you're seeing, right? How about now? What are you seeing now? What do you see with this one? <laughs> and I'll read them out for everyone who is uh, bored, who's logging in. Boring. Yeah. They are bored. Me in high school. I like that, Michelle. <laughs> Disengaged. Tired. Bored. Yeah, okay. Somebody said bored ass kids. That's what you see, Shira. I got you. <laughs> kids checked out because they are bored out of their minds, says Jessica. I'm seeing it. Bored and, diseng and disengaged. So you guys are seeing, you're seeing these young people, right? You're seeing some of these things right here. Um, students that are not being challenged. Thank you for that joy, right? Now, let me ask you, I got one more perspective in school. I want to see if you see this one anytime. How about this one here? What's your perspective on this? What do you see? Anybody ever see this in your classroom? Okay, what do you see? <laughs> Bart, yeah, my my classroom. Oh, somebody put 2023. I like that, Jeremy. Childhood, engagement, accommodation. Mm, outdated teacher. Interesting. I like how you put it to the teacher. Um, our current society in school, says Elizabeth, LAUSD in the building. Um, Latoya says she sees distractions, while Juan sees Beverly Hills, okay? Ooh, Angela sees it as cheating kids. Interesting. Um, teacher competing with tech, right? Is that a BlackBerry? Yes, it's a BlackBerry. It's supposed to be. We're a little outdated, but I, it's the point. It's the point. I'm trying to get you to see it, right? Students on their phone not paying attention, right? Phone addicts. Interesting. Old methodologies for new students. Maria, I like that. Interesting. Um, students engage with their phones. Huh, that's an interesting way to see it. Notice these are all perspectives. They're different perspectives of how we each see students in our classrooms, right? Here, I want to pass it next to a perspective that sometimes we don't really think about. And I'm going to ask my man Mike to um, hit play on this video, and then we're going to chat on this on the other side. Go ahead, sir. Rise and shine. 
Come on, man, get up. Oh, boy. Come on, get up. School day, y'all gonna be late. Go, get to school. Go, get up. Come on, man. Damn, Wallace. Damn, Wallace, nothing. That happens like y'all don't go to school. As soon enough, they're gonna be calling around. All y'all gonna end up in foster care. Y'all want foster care? Just climb your little black ass back in the bed then. Well, get out of my way, man. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about perspective. What perspective did you get from this video? Mm. Anna said, I see and hear my students in this video. Wow. Kids raising kids. Looks like some people weren't able to hear it. Some people said priorities. Man, I'm loving some of the things you're, you guys are, are, are giving me. This is great. My students. Wow. Responsibility of older siblings. So you guys are you guys are talking about things that you probably see every day in school. And some teachers take a different perspective because think of those kids that you just saw there. Those kids are on their way to school. And when they get to school, first of all, what was what was their breakfast? Was it a healthy, nice, nutritious, a balanced meal? What what was their breakfast? What did they get to eat? And see and think about that, right? Think about what they had to eat for that morning. And then those students come to your class and they may be a little wild because they had a, a they had a juice and some chips. Consider that, right? So we have to think about our young people and think about a different perspective and see them for what they're going through. Consider that. Let me see here. Let's see if I missed anything. All right, so when we talk about this perspective, this idea, think about what type of building they were in, right? They were in a vacant building, right? And if, and if you looked at the end of it, when they closed the door, it said, if animal trap, please call this number. Not about, not worried about a people, about if any people, any young people are trapped or in there, right? And think about why do you think, right? Because we all know that's Michael B. Jordan when he was younger, right? But why do you think that his character is keeping those kids. Why do you think he's doing that? He's not getting paid for it. He's not getting, he's not getting um, uh, any type of reward for, for doing that. He's probably taking some of his money to pay for some of that. I want to share this in the chat. Guy Hill said that was heavy. Gave me a different perspective that I know is true, but I forget about. See, we're human. We're teachers. We're human, right? And guy said, I was reminded of this by a colleague today when a student dropped the F-bomb. She said, he's raising himself. Consider that, right? And, and here's the thing. You know, I, I watched a teacher go off on a student 
that was in school in her classroom because he forgot a pencil and some paper. And I'm sitting here like, yo, I wonder how he even had to get here today. Like, the fact that he's here, let's take that as the win and let's go with that. And that's what we got to we gotta change our perspective, right? So it's just something that I want you, want you guys to think about because we, we really are talking about perspective. So I want to keep it moving. The important thing is building relationships with these types of students, right? And the best thing to do is to start where those students are. And that can be difficult, especially for our generation. Many of, many of us on here are probably Gen Z, maybe a few millennials, I don't know, right? But it's like we know the struggle we took to get to where we had to go, right? And we want those kids to see that, but they see things differently. Let's talk about how they see it. Their youth culture, take a look at this. See, we're Generation Z, but here's what they see, right? Android, Instagram, Apple, um, you know, Twitch, TikTok, PayPal, YouTube, like they move at the speed of light. And here's what you got to understand. Sometimes they move faster than we can even think of. And we've got to consider that when we are moving forward, when we're teaching them. We got to think about where they are coming from, right? So um, I want you guys to really consider some of the things that we're talking about. Um, let's see here. Let's go on. Let's talk about youth culture in school. When our kids come to school, here's the first thing they see. Now, I'm not sure about your 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 school, but I'm pretty sure it's pre probably probably pretty close, right? No cell phones, no hats, no hoodies, no sun, no no any no no. It, everything that they see is a bunch of no no no, right? And it's like I get it. I know why we do it because somebody even put it in the chat earlier. Um, uh, you talked about basically distractions. And I get that. But here's the thing. If you constantly tell somebody no, no is the negative. Sometimes that makes them want to rebel or consider, not even consider listening to you. Let me, let's throw some things out. I want to ask you guys a question. For our, our generation, I see, I see we got some boomers, we got some, some Gen Xers, et cetera. What does this emoji mean to you? What does that emoji mean? We are only in the question option, Savannah. The chat is down, so we're making do. We're going to make it work, right? This emoji means lit. Thank you, Vivian. Yes, lit. That's what the, the young people are saying, lit or even fire. But it technically means lit. Oh, that's going to be lit. It's lit tonight. It's lit, all right? That's how they're saying. Now. Let me ask you guys a question. If I said to you, oh, man, Uncle John was lit last night, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Uncle John was lit last night. <laughs> Drunk, drunk as a skunk, high, you guys got it, right? And so consider how small things are changing, right? Uncle John was faded, as Felicia says, right? Drunk, all of you, you get it, right? Because we speak the language of our times. And so what we need to do is kind of consider how they think, how they speak, how they do. Right. Instead of discounting it, because it's real easy to discount it. It's real easy to say, don't talk like that in here. Don't do that in here in my classroom. Right. It's very easy to say that. But let's think. Let's think about Gen Z. Like, right. Let's some things to keep in mind with, with this generation. Um, they grew up in a digital world. They've never had a time where there wasn't the Internet. There was no Internet. They've never had a time where there was no cell phone. Think about that for just a quick second. 
they've never had a time when they couldn't just pull something out of the air. Let me ask y'all a question. How many of y'all remember an encyclopedia? <laughs> I feel like I'm I feel like I'm talking about something a relic from a lost age, right? And so now, of course you can have your kids use that and learn that, right? But they don't really they don't really they can't really fathom that. That takes too long. And they move at a fast pace, right? Um you know, sometimes with them, and here's something to keep in mind, real and virtual, sometimes that's intertwined. Sometimes it's kind of like, hmm, it's like, well, right? Now, it's our job as educators to, to help them understand that and help them make their way through it. But we first got to realize it, right? They're not only consumers of the internet, they're some of the greatest contributors to it. This is a generation that thinks on their feet. They're quick. They can get on that internet and figure out anything. And so as teachers, I always look at my fellow teachers and I say, hey, how can we use that to our advantage? How can we bend what they do to us? And that's what this is about, right? They love being constantly connected and engaged, and they'd rather learn by doing. They like to, they, they're more trial and error. They're ready to just jump into it, right? And so if you keep some of these things in mind, it helps you make some of your decisions when you're in the classroom. Consider this, though. A lot of times we consider the things that they do as less intelligent. I want to chat about that for a second. Take a look at this slide. Now, they got these abbreviations. They're LOLs, they're SMHs, WID, right? And they got their sayings, wavy, lit, facts. And then you can bring some of the old ones um, on fleek, turn up you know, squat, and I oop. Ah, you remember that one? Uh, oh, I, I used to love the OK Boomer. <laughs> Kid hit me with that. I was like, wait a minute. I'm not a baby boomer. Look at me. Mm. Playing right into it. What I want you to do right now is look at the right side of this, of this um, slide, and you'll see at the top. What do you see there at the top from ancient Egypt? What are those? Exactly, hieroglyphics, right? Now, if you look at the bottom, you'll see emojis. Think about what I'm saying right here. You see these emojis? And these kids can write a whole sentence. You've seen it. Think about it. They can write a whole sentence with those emojis, and we'd be sitting there looking like, what'd you say? Lost. Now, when the Egyptians did it all those thousands of years ago, we considered them to be intelligent. And when our students do that, we're saying that ah, that's not really writing. You're not really doing English. You're not really communicating. See, it's about perspective. This is what I'm talking about. It's about changing your perspective of how you see youth culture. Take how you see youth culture, and you got to flip it on its ear. I'm going to give you some more. We're going to keep going, but I hope you're starting to see what I'm saying. Think about it. Yes, guy emojis are today's hieroglyphics. Consider it like that, right? So let's move on. This is how they see the world, y'all, right? It's, it's TikTok videos. Um, this is the selfie generation. I've never seen somebody take more pictures of themselves than this generation. And now I've seen people in my generation, Gen X. I've seen us doing it now. We didn't follow the law. <laughs> but they're constantly advertised to. Right. Think about the Super Bowl. Go to the Super Bowl, the biggest, the biggest, basically, event on earth with advertisements in the millions. And you got a halftime show full of hip hop acts. And then think of these snacks, things like the rap icon snacks. So they're constantly bombarded by all that stuff. And you talk about rap and you talk about hip hop and a lot of them don't even understand hip hop. This is why we are in the higher education arenas doing this work. Because they hear hip-hop music and they love it, but they don't quite understand it. And when I speak to many students, they don't even know where it came from and how it started, right? So consider that. Let's talk about hip-hop. What is hip-hop? Hip-hop is a culture with roots in music and dance, and it's cultural resources related to identities, 
values, and aspirations of some youth. We're not saying every youth is hip-hop. That's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is that hip-hop culture has uh, permeated youth culture. So many of these students know and understand hip-hop, um, but they may not quite totally get it. And so that's okay, right? And so I kind of want to just give you a little, just a little taste of what hip-hop is. Many of you, I'm sure you know, but we'll just talk about it. <laughs> Those rap snaps are good, though, huh? <laughs> All right, four main elements of hip-hop. DJing, graffiti, b-boying or breakdancing, and, of course, emceeing. Now, hip-hop was started with the DJ. Um, the DJ in the early 70s, we're talking South Bronx, New York, where you had a – you had – Young people who, because of um, cutbacks uh, to government programs, cutbacks to school programs, many schools had stopped having um, arts programs and music. And so these young people still wanted to do something creative. And so they started trying to figure out a way to still do something, but I don't have many resources. Well, my mom has a turntable and my uncle has a turntable and they got some records what can I do with that? And so people start figuring out, hey, there's a piece of this record, this James Brown song, where it kind of has a part where nobody's rapping. And I mean, nobody's talking or singing. And it's kind of like, hmm, what can I do with that? Right? And it's this idea of let's take that and try to create something where we can have music going. And then these guys on the side and some of these young ladies are standing there and they're waiting until that drum break comes on where there's no music. That's the part where they get most excited. And then they start dancing or doing something where they're jumping on their head. And what in the world is that? And so Cool Herc starts calling it, hmm, that's the, 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 the break boys or the break girls. And that's how it gets this idea of b-boying. And of course, for those of you who may know or may not know, the term breakdancing, that was given by the media. The B-boys in the beginning, they never called themselves breakdancers. That was given by the media. And then you have graffiti, which actually came before all of these. Graffiti predates all of these because graffiti has been around, right? But this idea of doing tags and actual throw-ups that actually have um, styles and eventually they would become called wild styles, this came out of people being ingratiated in the culture and listening to the music as they're creating, and it became a part of the culture. The very last element of hip-hop to ever come was the MC. The MC came out of, uh, out of a need. Uh, it's usually, it started with the DJ saying things like, um, you know, announcement, yo, there's going to be a party next week. He would say that on the mic while he's DJing, and then it just got more difficult to do, so he would call a friend in. The DJ would call a friend in. And that, that friend would come in and kind of MC. He would kind of let people know, hey, here's what's going on, you know, uh, and then they start saying it real cool. And they would say things like the hip hop, the hip, the hip, the hip, the hip, hip the hop, you don't, hey, here we go. And, and, and people started to say this, this, we're going to that party. It's those kind of parties because it wasn't called hip hop when it first started in the 70s. They would call it the jam or one of those parties. It was different than a disco party or something like that. And so they, they got this idea of hip-hop from different things that they would say at these parties. And that's where that came from. And that's how that came out of that. And so it's very interesting to, to learn that, you know, hip-hop came together rather organically. And that's something to keep in mind, right? Because now hip-hop is more than just rap music. A lot of people just associate it with the music. And that's all they think about. But hip hop has extended to so many expressive practices. And we're talking about fashion, movies, TV, social media, sports, entrepreneurship. Um, it's everywhere because hip hop is culture. Now, think about that for a second. Okay, if hip hop is culture, then what is culture? Here's your definition straight from Merriam Webster. And yes, I went to the dictionary, I didn't look it up online. Y'all should be happy for me. All right. The beliefs, customs, arts, et cetera, of a particular society or group. Think about that. Beliefs, customs, arts, and I just listed those three. But think about hip-hop. 
Think about our young people. Does hip hop have certain beliefs? You better believe it. Does it have customs? Is it arts? Is it something that people do um, together, right? Is it a way of life? That's how some people live. And I'll be honest with you. I am hip hop. I live that way. I love it, right? For me, it signifies common values, beliefs, and perspectives. So it takes this idea and it, and it puts it together because you can say youth culture, that's pretty much hip hop culture. And so if you take these two things and you think about them in that way, it's kind of like, so why, why would I use that in, in education? Well, now this makes sense. Now I, I'm kind of getting it because it says scholars have studied why hip hop should be used to promote it, right? But why should we use it? Because some urban youth feel alienated by normal classroom activities. Okay, go back to your perspective. When you guys looked at the, the boy meets world, you got the little kids falling asleep, or you looked at the Bart Simpson, you got you got um, the the young people sitting there and they're on their phones, right? Because they're not engaged. How can we take the things that our young people are involved with and use it to engage them? Y'all follow me? Come on, who with me? Who with me? Think about it, right? Think about it. So it's like. Um, the practices in which students engage, the dancing, the, 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 the research into rappers' life. There's so many different ways you can do it to bring it in the classroom. And my brother Chris Emden talks about that, and we're going we're gonna to jump into that soon. But I want to keep going on this idea of hip-hop and education. So here's what you get. You get what we call hip-hop-based education. Now, this is something that we have been um, working on for, for some years now, the hip-hop ed movement. Um, and this is the idea. It's meeting students where they are, giving them a voice by centering their culture and pedagogy. Think about what that means for a second. Giving them a voice by centering their culture and the pedagogy. I'm not telling you guys that you should go out and start rapping. If you go out and tell somebody that I said that, shame on you. That's not what I'm saying. Because not everybody raps. Not everybody Produces, not everybody DJs, not everybody makes beats. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is allow the students to have a voice in your classroom. And I'm going to expand that in a moment because you should draw from the students' own experiences. Ooh, so the things that they're going through, use that to help teach them. Think about that for a second, right? And then the thing about hip hop based education, we always talk about the event. There's a meeting and an interaction. And that's where we start talking about a cipher. And we talk about, um, for those of you who are into hip hop and understand what a cipher is, a cipher is when, and it can be in any of the elements, right? Where you get into a circle and ideas are exchanged or there's a battle. It could be rap, it could be um, b-boying or break dancing. Uh, it could be, it could even be uh, DJ battles. Like you, you, it's called a cipher. And even graph, uh, graph battles have occurred similarly. They just, there's not a, a, a cipher, but ba the battle is the same nonetheless. This idea of the event, the competition, because in hip hop, the competition is important. It's how you get better. It's, it's when you hear somebody and you're inspired by them, it's like, oh, okay, I see you. That makes me go and sharpen up my skills. Think about how can you take that and bring that into your classroom? See, this is what I'm talking about, taking it to the next level. It's not about just bringing in Biggie's lyrics or bringing in Tupac's lyrics and looking for the nouns, the pronouns, the prepositions. That's not what we're saying. We're saying take the students' experiences, bring that into the classroom, and use that to shape their learning. Consider that. All right. I, wanna, I, want, I want you guys to hear a quick description of hip-hop-based education from a voice other than mine. So I'm going to let uh, my brother, Dr. Christopher Emden, if you're not hip to him, let him kind of break it down. And uh, my brother, Mike, I'll let you hit the uh, video. Hip hop is important to bring into schools and the process of schooling because it is the culture of young people. Uh, for as long as we can remember people like John Dewey, amazing, brilliant people like Laura Latson Billings, um, even by Godsky to a certain extent, all these folks were considered to be the icons in the world of education who have led us to think about education differently, have educated for a student-centered, culture-focused curriculum. The culture of this new generation is hip-hop. 
Hip hop is the cultural artifact and art form that is transplanted from the Bronx, New York City to all over the planet. It has captured the minds, thoughts, ideas of a whole new generation of people. If we are truly to engage in culturally relevant, critically engaging, um, and student-centered, student-focused pedagogies, then we have to focus on hip hop. You know, whenever we think about hip hop and talk about hip hop, um, historically or even in a contemporary sense, there are a few things that have always been present. And one of those things has always been the event. Hip hop has always revolved around the event. It's not to say that what happens every day doesn't matter, mm -hmm. but our culture always celebrates this coming together. And so when you have a hip hop battle or you have a poetry slam, all you're doing is carrying on the tradition of the event within the culture. And competition has always been a part of what we do. It's the way that you, it's the way that you get your skills sharpened. It's the way that you, you challenge yourself to move to a different level. And it's also a way of celebration. You know, we compete not to tear each other down. We compete to be able to build each other up. Mm -hmm. As a culture, we don't necessarily have to engage in the teaching and learning experience in a sort of Anglo-centric and centered way. Um, the, the, that way necessitates there being a teacher giving information to a learner. Um, the way that learning happens within hip hop communities more broadly is that information is exchanged. That's why, that's why I talk about the battle in the slam. In a battle in the slam, that's a learning experience, right? Everybody who's performing is performing to showcase what they have. The person who's listening and, 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 and who's competing with is soaking in the information from the person who's performing. So we are exchanging in this dialogue in that moment. The exchange is the teaching and learning experience. Dialogue in itself is pedagogy. Like dialogue is teaching and learning. And that's the way it's always been. So whether it's the barbershop, you know, I talk about the P Pentecostal pedagogy, like teaching and learning as, as it exists in the black church. Whether it's, whether it's in a cipher, you know, that's what teaching and learning looks like. There's no teaching and learning if one person in that process is passive. Everybody has to be actively engaged in the exchange of information. Consistent affirmation of the performer is a piece of the learning experience because one, it's not only an affirmation, it's also a valuing, it's also information for the performer to know that that's a point where they've said something or invoked an emotion that speaks to the audience. In itself, a, a, a constellation of pedagogical moments in, in a cipher or, or in a battle or in a slam, you know what I mean? And we have to we have to go beyond looking at them as these isolated um, things that happen um, to do a show, but more of a bringing folks together to engage. All right, so, and, and that's the idea um, of what Hip Hop Ed is. Uh, if you are on Twitter, you can check them out. Uh, they are on Twitter every, Tuesday night, so uh, tonight at 8.15, so uh, I'm sorry, 8.30, so after our event, go for it, go for it, okay? Um, I am having a lot of good things uh, in the chat. I'm seeing some questions. You. Keep your questions. We are definitely going to get to them. Uh, I don't know, Mike, you think good time to take yep. a couple questions? We yeah we we absolutely absolutely can and again thank you everyone for participating in the Q and A chat I respond to some of the questions about the regular audience chat um, but please uh, enter your questions and thoughts here you all are doing a great job of it um, you know uh, one of the questions we had um, was uh, for someone who does not listen this is for one of our teachers out of Whitesboro who says for someone who does not listen to hip hop where should I start. Uh, who should I, should I listen to first? And I know that's a, a you have 50 years of hip hop, so that, that's a relatively broad question. Um, yeah. But a uh, great place, place to start. And then there were others that were consistent with that who were asking about, like, say, for instance, songs that they could perhaps use in a classroom that might uh, obviously be settings appropriate um, that might allow, you know, introduce themselves as well as maybe their students um, to the richness. I of the, the culture. Yeah, so I'm going to answer that in a way that nobody here is probably expecting. First of all, <laughs> um, you're not the expert on hip hop, right? And obviously, if you're asking that question, you're not, which is okay. I'm not expecting you to be. The, ex the experts are right there in front of you. See, here's the thing. You got you to gotta find out from them. Ask them, what are you listening to? And this is what I love to do. And here's the thing. You are going to get answers like Sexy Red and all these others, super vulgar, 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 nasty, nasty, nasty. You're going to get all of that, right? And so that puts you in a space to have a conversation. 
Now, if we're talking, you know, second graders, maybe not, right? Maybe you do something a little different. But if we're talking middle school to high school, you can have intelligent conversations. And what you need to do is speak to your students and talk to them about this song or that song and talk about the lyrics and discuss it and, and let them know where you're coming from. Because, see, you can't just come in on day one and just ask them to play music or you just play something and, and it's going to vibe. You have to build relationships. You've got to get to know your students. So by doing that, they start to know you. They start to understand, hey, um, you know, uh, my teacher, Mrs. Castillo Rodriguez, she, she don't really – she don't really play that, you know, that kind of that kind of music. So I can't bring that in here, but I can find the clean version and let her hear it. That kind of thing, right? Because your students will get to know you, and once you're building that relationship, they'll respect you, right? And but I'm you're not going to be able to just come in and just do this. This takes work, people. This is what I need you to understand. This is not like you watch my thing, my um, presentation today, October seventeenth, and now. Tomorrow on Wednesday, October 18th, you go in and you just start playing all kinds of hip hop and your kids fall in line and they start listening and it's all hunky dory and everything's beautiful. No, that is not how it works. What needs to happen is you need to put your students in a cipher on Wednesday, October 18th, and you need to take a little time and build with your students. You need to get to know your students. You need to have some conversations and find out and learn about your students. And then you learn that, you know, such and such was was um, like in the Michael B. Jordan video, and you didn't even know that. Or you might learn that um, little Johnny's grandmother has been really sick, and you wonder why he started acting up in your class. You couldn't figure it out, and now it's starting to click. So in order to be able to play the songs, you got you to gotta get to know the students first. That'll be my suggestion. And the kids will give you the songs, and then you got to do your research. Okay. You got to do your research. Um, yes, and people play instrumentals. I see that in the chat as well, which is great, right? Um, and, and the call and response technique is excellent. That's one of the best things, if you can get that going. But, you know, you might have to have your students teach you. Um, I had a time when I did call and response, and I was doing the old school mic check, one, two, one, two, right? And they was like, you know, that's, that's so old school. Why are you doing that? And the, and the kid, I was like, so what would y'all do? What, what's the cool call and response for y'all? And that's where I got, uh, if you saw the TED Talk, that's where I got the Red Robin. And the kid said, Red Robin. And everybody in the class said, yo. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. Call and response. But it worked, right? Um, yes, awesome. kids into anime. Kelly, you got it. And that's where I'm going with this. You got it. I'm about to go there. Yeah. Um, any, another question? Yes, yes, yes. And thank you for that, too. I want to uh, chime in. Jessica put also give options for students to create playlists for characters or historical figures. What I would say when I was in the classroom, I always enjoyed having the students demonstrate learning by creating mixtapes. Yep. So they literally create their own mix, mixtape based around, you know, War of 1812, based on, you know, <laughs> uh, the March in Selma, all these things. So that's great. I will say this. This is a great question, and I can hold off until later for it, but it's fairly simple, and it's one that I'm sure that comes up quite a bit that you've been asked, which is, what is the difference between hip-hop and rap? You can shelve that for later if you would like, but uh, I just uh, I can would love for you to answer. find it out. <laughs> I can answer it real quick. Um, so yeah. that is a question. I, I do a whole lesson of, of that for my um, college students when I teach that course. Um, hip hop is the entire culture. Hip hop is everything. The DJing, the MCing, the b-boying or break dancing, and the graffiti. It's the culture. It's the idea. It's the customs. It's the whole thing. Rap is just the musical element. When you're thinking of just the music, that's the rap part or, you know, the the Really, it's kind of the MC and the DJ together. So if that helps anyone, hopefully, hopefully that helps. Yeah, okay, that's, that's great. Yeah, we can we can we can move on. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and move on. Um, you guys are giving me so much. This is so beautiful. I appreciate everything. Like, if you guys can't, I don't know if they can see the Q and A, but please look at some of the ideas that are coming into the chat because this is you guys. You learn from each other. That's the best way to learn. Learn from each other, right? Um, <clears throat> okay. So let's keep it moving. When you're talking about youth culture, 
Um, my partner John and I came up with this idea, what we call youth culture pedagogy. And it's this idea of using youth culture in the classroom. Because what I began to notice, and I, and I lost it, somebody mentioned it um, where they talked about anime. I began to notice that students are into a lot of different things. And if you begin to know your students, you'll see this. I had students into anime, I have students into skateboarding, I had students into calligraphy. I, I begin to notice that students find something that they connect with. And what they loved about me was they could see my passion for hip hop and they connected with me on that level. And so what I began to see was some of them may not always connect on hip hop as strongly. They listen to it, it's cool, they know it, but you know, I'm more of an anime. I'm more of a skateboarder. I had a young young student, a male who was into skateboarding. Now, I'm a 40-something-year-old man. I don't skateboard. Never. I have never skateboarded, so I don't know anything about it. So you know what I did? I became the student. And this young man was teaching me all about skateboarding. And you should see his eyes light up as he's explaining everything about Ollie's and all this other stuff that I can't even remember because I can't tell you because I don't remember. But this this young man, he lit up when he was explaining to me, right? And then we would have conversations and I would say, oh, lovely. So when you're talking about this, this reminds me of, you know, XYZ and hip hop. You know, Dell the Funky Homo Sapien is a skateboarder. So have you ever heard of Dell? No, I never heard of him. Oh, well, let me play this for you. And, and so I get a, a student who becomes a Dell and a Hieroglyphics and Souls of Mischief fan because we had that conversation about skateboarding. Now, when that student is there and we're having conversations, I notice that that student isn't like those early slides where I had. He's not falling asleep in my classroom, and he's also not on his cell phone because he's invested in me because I invested in him. Think about what I just said there. That student is invested in what I'm telling them because I show them that I'm invested in what they're telling me about them. And now when that student's running down the hallway, I can look at them and say, hey, hey, come on, man. Don't, you, know, you know better than that. And it's like, I got you, Mr. Rawls, right? Whereas another student can say that who hasn't, who hasn't built that relationship, who hasn't taken that time to build that relationship, and they might get cussed out. All right, my, my LAUSD, I know y'all know about that, right? And so you might, you might look at that student and say, oh, that student's a bad kid. He's a bad, that, that's bad. But that, that may not be the case, okay? K-pop, K-pop right now, that's a big, big deal. Get to know which students are into it. Get to know what students are talking about. And definitely Lupe Fiasco's kick push. Let me tell you a little bit about youth culture power. And here, we, John and I came up with four tenets to help you understand that. The first one, embrace youth culture. See, this is what we're talking about, changing your perspective. It's not going to work if you have the old school mentality of their kids, they should just shut up, sit there at the desk, and be quiet, and I pour everything into them while they just sit there and listen, and I teach, and, and that's it. See, the problem with that is, you should be learning too. I learn from my students. All of you on here, if you don't learn from your students, you're missing out on an, on an excellent opportunity. You should be learning from your students. You should be, be getting that information from them and, and learning from them so you learn how to teach them. How else are you going to learn how to teach them if you don't learn from them, right? As teachers, we are lifelong learners, and that's what we are. Another thing that's important, creating an affable learning environment. Now, think about what I'm saying there, an affable learning environment. The environment, when the, when the students walk in, what, what do they see on the walls? What does it smell like? What's the aroma? What, you know, how are they greeted when they walk in the room? Are you looking out like, hurry up, sit down, get out your pencil, do your, do your bell work, right? Or is it, good morning, how you doing today? I notice you look a little tired. Is everything good? Or the student that you are getting to know, hey, last week you told me about your grandmother. How's she doing? She, is she cool? Okay, good. Hey, you know, I know that your, your brother's deployed. You know, he's overseas. When, when is he coming back? How is he doing? Has he, has he written you? Like little things like that go a long way. When you create that affable environment for your students, you let them know that you're paying attention to them and they're going to give it back to you. 
I promise you, they'll give it back to you. And that goes with the R. You're building relationships, and you have to maintain those. You got to build them. You got to work. See, this is work, y'all. I'm, I'm trying to explain to you. This is work. This is not something that you're going to do in one day. This takes time, and it takes a lot of work on your part, but it's doable. And the last thing I want to talk about, um, for those of you that are into um, government and that type of thing, um, develop an egalitarian teaching style. And if you don't know what that is, I hope you look it up a little later. You know, you got Google. You don't have to go to the encyclopedia. <laughs> but egalitarian, uh, egalitarian teaching style is one where you give your students a voice, right? You give your students the opportunity to have a voice and have a say in your room. And many of you already do it. I know you do because I've, I've seen it, right, where, you know, you let students have a chore or have something where they, um, where they give and they, they add to the class. Let them um, add to the com community. Let them add to the community and let them add to what's going on in that classroom. And when you do that, if you put them all together, C-A-R-E, care, right, it's care. It's, it's, it's you caring. That's the bottom line. That's the, the, the crux of youth culture pedagogy. You have to care. And, and some, some teachers struggle with that, especially those who have been burnt out. And I understand it. I definitely get it. But you got to take it there if that's what you want to do. And the thing about that, if you use youth culture pedagogy and you combine it with hip hop, now you can even use the things that we sat in, in classes and learned about. The theories where you talk about Bloom's taxonomy or even Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, right, where you talk about using visual and spatial compared to graffiti art, right, the MC, um, DJing with the logical and mathematical, um, the musical with DJing and producing, bodily and kinesthetic, right, so you can actually change your perspective and still use the theories and concepts that we were all taught. I had somebody ask me, where do I find youth culture? And hopefully you guys get these slides so you can have this because I don't have time to stay here. But these are just some ideas. I had a, someone who asked about the songs. Um, you, can, you can definitely get songs and bring songs in. But what you could also do is start kind of looking around and learning about youth culture in general. That's the most important thing. So here's what we're doing. We're building relationships with these students because, and I don't even know if I even need to say all this, right? But human relations exist and in and through shared spaces. It's this idea of our students are there and we need to see them. Teaching is building educational relations. Um, an educational relation is different from any other. It's so transitional. See, think about, this is Sadorkin and Bingham. This is something that's very important, right? And so I always get people say, well, you know, how do I do this? That's the, that's the main question I get. How do I do this? How do I do this? So I want to share a, a couple of examples. I put one, but let's, let's do a couple. So John and I came up with this idea, and that's what our second book, it's a, it's an, a list of activities. It's called How Can I Move the Crowd, a Classroom Activity Handbook. And we give activities like this to help you get ideas, but we're just planting the seed. We're teaching you how to fish. You've got to learn from your students in order to actually really activate this. So let's do this Twitter gram fails, Twitter grammar fails. Um, you ever met some boy of Twitter, then you meet up and they got the same outfit that they have on their profile pic, LOL. And you can say to your students, okay, French Montana might have been rushing on this one. Somebody, let's help him put this in, in proper English for me. Go for it. And you let your students do that. It makes sense to them. They get that, right? Um, and, and this is an idea that you can use and build upon it. Here's another one. This will take some work. It's a process, but it's a rewarding one, right? You got this idea of Instagram posts. Um, so you can take a picture of someone that you're going to study. Like in this example, we have <clears throat> Nelson Mandela. And so we give, we give Nelson an Instagram page and we tell our students to hashtag it. Because think about our kids. They speak memes. Our kids speak hashtags. 
They speak emoji. They know how to do that. That works for them, right? So if we take some of those ideas and flip them to what we need, then it makes sense, right? And the way you can do this is go on the internet. You can find uh, templates like this, and it takes some work. Remember, I'm telling you it takes some work, but you can actually take this, make it, and, and add, it in, add in your own flavor, right? So I want to play a game with y'all before we end, and I want to take plenty of questions, but I want to play a game. John and I came up with an idea that we call the hashtag games. Now, the hashtag games are when you're trying to introduce a new lesson um, or even do a review, you want to put up pictures and you want your students to hashtag it because they do that. And think about what a hashtag really is. Think about that for a second. You ever heard of the main idea? right? It's the main idea. And so I'm teaching them something that they need to know for the state test, main idea. But we just have to make sure that we make that connection for them, right? So we're going to take the hashtag games, and I'm going to start out with things they know. So I want to play that with y'all. Can we play the hashtag game? You guys ready to put this in the chat? All right, I need y'all to participate. We're going to have fun for these last few minutes. Okay, I'm going to put up a picture, and I want you to hashtag it. Just anything that comes to mind, hashtag it. Go. Hashtag that picture. What do you got? What do you see? What do you got? Hashtag Jake, right? <laughs> hashtag State Farm. Hashtag Khakis, right? Because what I'm doing is the first one, we all are familiar with this. This makes sense. We understand this, right? So this is how I start out. Hashtag Jake, hashtag hardly working, hashtag can you hear me now, hashtag busy, hashtag target. I love it. <laughs> hashtag cubicle. You guys are the best. This is crazy. Hashtag boring insurance. Hashtag not that personal, right? Okay, I got another one for you. This is going to be a good one. Let's see how many we get on this. Hashtag this picture. Go. Hashtag this picture. <laughs> oh, these are great. These are great. Oh, man, we got to tell some of these. Hashtag Swifties, hashtag OMG, hashtag oh Lord, <laughs> hashtag bad mustache. I love it. Hashtag Taven, hashtag Swifty Ball, hashtag hype, hashtag had enough, hashtag um, Swifty, right? Hashtag trailer, hashtag <laughs> I got a song, hashtag Taylor's next heartbreak song. Wow. <laughs> See how much fun that we can have with these? And these are relevant. These are hashtags that I might use for you guys. Maybe your kids don't know this. I don't know, right? Maybe they do, right? But think about your audience. These are hashtags that I made for you guys. So you can take it and make hashtags that you need to make. And then once you get them to understand, now you want to teach a lesson. Now I want you guys to hashtag this. What does this say to you? Hashtag that. Hashtag that picture that you see right there. Hashtag what? Hashtag what? <laughs> these hashtags are fun. You guys are great at these. Ah, hashtag Liberté Revolution. This is a great little game for current events or for a lesson. Yes, it is. Hashtag war. Hashtag Bastille Day, hashtag French Revolution, you get it, right? So now, once you get your people, get your students talking and you get them understanding, you get them on this hashtag, now you can bring it to something current. Now, hashtag this one for us. You see the comparisons? This is you thinking and, and linking what happened in the past to what's going on now. So you make it so that it's not as boring. You make it so that it's relevant. You make it so that they're engaged. 
hashtag traffic, hashtag uh, revolution. You guys get it. Hashtag protest. This is what you do. And, and you see how you're having fun, Emily? Your students will have fun because this makes sense to them. This is current. This brings them to something familiar, and that's what we're talking about. Give your students something that's familiar and that makes sense to them, and then they can learn. Our kids can learn. Our kids can learn. I am a firm believer in that, right? Here's something Grandmaster Cass said, and I said it in my TED Talk. Hip-hop didn't invent anything. It reinvented everything. Here's what I'm telling you that you should do. I want you to sample youth culture. You guys have heard of hip-hop beats. We're going to sample youth culture. We're going to take a little piece of youth culture, right? Then we're going to mix in something that we learned from the past, maybe multiple intelligences, maybe Bloom's taxonomy. Then we're going to take a little sample of what you learned from your students. Oh, what would you get from your kids? What would you learn about anime? What would you learn about um, – about K-pop that you can put into something that you can use to teach them. Now you're going to remix that into your classroom into something that works for you. See, your lesson should feel like you just made a dope beat. So the next time y'all come on here and we talk, we have a conversation, all of y'all should be telling me, oh, Rawls, I made a dope beat. I made a dope beat. And what you should be doing is taking samples and pieces and remixing your lessons and changing it up. That's the goal. That's what I want you to do. And in order to do that, you've got to change your perspective, right? You've got to center hip-hop and youth culture in your classroom so it becomes this bridge. This is how you build positive relationships with your students because it allows you to increase student engagement. It allows those students to feel culturally connected to the lessons. See, I want to learn if, if I feel connected. It's about being connected. It makes sense for our students, right? And then it allows you to be a more effective teacher. See, now you're getting Teacher of the Year awards and, and Teacher of the whole LAUSD, and everybody's like, well, why, how'd you do that? Hey, let them know. Like, I just listen to my students. That's all you got to do, right? Take it to the lab, chop it, and screw it. Let them know, Roberto. That's what it is. That is hip-hop. And that's what I mean by a hip-hop mentality, and that's what I mean by changing your perspective to a hip-hop mindset. It's not just about just using Tupac and Biggie lyrics in the classroom. Take the concepts of youth culture and use it to create in your classroom and, and teach your students. So what I would like to do is have questions. I'm going to leave up um, this QR code if you want to go and find out more about my work with my brother John Robinson. Um, two books, Youth Culture Power, um, which is the book that talks about our theory, Youth Culture Pedagogy. And we have an album, a CD that describes that. It's also on uh, Apple Music, et cetera, right? But this is for teachers. Many people see this and think it's for kids. It's not. Why would I make music for kids? They, they don't want to hear me. They don't want to hear a 50-year-old man. This music is for us. This is encouragement for teachers for administrators, et cetera. So what I want you to do is listen to Youth Culture Power, the songs, and hear are some of the, the themes and ideas. The, the chapters in the songs um, from the book, the chapters from the book all have song titles. So the song, each song goes more in depth about the book. Um, so please go to the uh, QR code there, look us up. And if you have questions or you want to connect with me or you would like to bring me and John or me by myself to come to your district, LAUSD, let's get it. There's my email, rawls.5 at osu.edu. My brother Mike, I got to say thank you. I appreciate you. Let's get it with some questions. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate it. And I said it at the beginning tonight. I just appreciate you accepting our uh, you know, invitation and, and being just so me, accessible. Yo, let me say, I got two questions I got to answer. I thought I answered them. Where can we yeah, Go ahead. Good. It's jr.com, and that QR code will take you there. Where can we purchase? It's jr.com. And do you come out to schools for, for professional development? Yes, Jessica. I do it all the time. I love doing that. Please bring me out to your school. That's the whole point. We are trying to reach teachers, and we're trying to work with teachers. So, yes, hit us up. Hit me at, the, um, at my uh, email or hit us on itsjr.com. Okay, Mike, go for it. 
That, that's awesome. That's awesome. And again, I, I encourage everyone to, um, you know, put your questions in the chat. I mean, uh, this evening has just been just so energetic and uh, so illuminating in so many ways. Uh, I had a question uh, earlier, um, and uh, it's a fairly long question, but uh, let me see if I can get through it and um, get your get your thoughts on it. But um, and she framed it and she said this may be a post lecture discussion question but she said uh she advises a spoken word a hip-hop student group and have produced uh and directed a few projects the emphasis on youth culture is great for k-12 and traditional age students however many of my students are non-traditional and would not classify as youth culture so i'm older than i am i teach hip-hop in my courses and i often discuss the ways in which aging populations are often vilified um uh, in the hip hop culture and how marginalized cultures can perpetuate marginalization. In what ways have you been able to adjust YCP to reach students, non-traditional undergrads, graduates, uh, who do not necessarily relate to the youth culture itself? I love it. I love it. Great question. So the easiest way to think about that is think about what I talked about when I talked about centering your students. doesn't matter what age they are, right? you got to center your students. So what you want to do is find out, like, your cl that classroom, I don't know, is it five students? Is it 10? Is it 20? Whatever it is, you need to have conversations with them. And they're older, so maybe they're not into, you know, TikTok or whatever, right? So you need to figure out what are they into? What do they listen to? I mean, and if they're closer to your age because you teach adults, that might make it even easier. So the, the, the answer really is you've got to learn those students. And here's the thing. Let me say this, everyone. This is, this, this is true for every classroom. Those of you who teach more than one class a day, guess what? You might have to learn five or six different student, different classrooms. And, and that's what I had to do. Each classroom is different. You know that. You guys, I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys know that that class that comes in after lunch is way different than that first period class that comes in in the morning. <laughs> So you've got to look at your students and, and figure out what works for them, no matter the age. Good deal. Th thank you for that. And also, I want to uh, give a, sh a shout out. Um, we have international participants as well. We have Carolina Acevedo, who is uh, in Rio de Janeiro, and she says that hip hop culture is very famous among youth students in Brazil and many teachers from favela, many teachers from favelas have used Brazilian hip hop to educate these students. And so uh, that was just a, a comment that, that she brought to the forefront. Uh, yeah, I'm going well. to Brazil. I'm going to Brazil in three weeks. I'll be in, um, in Sao Paulo, but, uh, and I may be in Rio as well, but yeah, Brazil, the world is really into hip hop right now. It's, it's huge everywhere. Oh man. That, well, thank you so much. And, you know, I, um, I'm interested in because next summer we'll be uh, hosting a Teaching African American Studies Institute with focuses around music and um, and arts. But I'm interested in uh, you know the art of sampling and uh, you mentioned it earlier and how you use it in the classroom. But particularly, I know that your music relies a lot on jazz, and yeah. uh, I'd be interested in hearing more about the ways that you hone in on. Uh, that sampling, whether it's to establish historical context among students, introduce them to the pioneers, um, and interested in knowing exactly like the roots of that, like where was where what was the genesis of that with you? What inspired you to really kind of delve into those classics and make that bridge and connect it with hip hop as an art form? Yeah, Yo, you must be reading my mind. So here <laughs> at Ohio State, I am actually working on. Um, uh, a class, we're going to have a class called um, Hip Hop Sampling as Archival Research. Because as you just said, his, um, when you sample and you dig, you learn about history. You learn about, uh, you know, if you sample a Marvin Gaye, you find out what was going on, you know, what's going on, right? You learn about, hey, so what was going on at this time to make him talk about picket lines and, 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 and war and things like that? What? And so you start learning it's an it's a record of history, right? And so um, what introduced me to it, though, your question, what introduced me to it was hip-hop, of course. Um, the first song that I really, really 
found the sample in my dad's records was um, You Got to Chill, EPMD. And when I found the, um, the Jungle Boogie, the, uh, the Cool in the Game, it, it, I lost my mind because I knew about the Zap. But I was like, where did he get? Okay, so this is like, okay. And so what I, what I actually started to realize was if I was digging into these classic songs and I would learn so much and I could interweave that and mix and create something new. The thing about it is it has taught me about music. It's what's earned me a position here in the School of Music at Ohio State University because I know music. I know hip hop. I know um, uh, I know jazz, I know funk, I know uh, reggae, I know rock, I know uh, opera because of hip hop, because I've been going through records for the last 30 years mm -hmm. and I understand music. So um, it's taught me a lot, man. Yes, I was. Yeah, I look forward to hearing more about the course on uh, the intro to sampling because uh, it's just it's a it's a it's a gateway hip hop is a gateway to so many art forms and appreciation of so many cultures, particularly, you know, as educators, when you have it and you use hip hop as a primary source tool and hip hop becomes text, you know, in the way that we're literate, you know, across different types of readings, and, uh, you know, hip hop is text and opening up just so many avenues for understanding you know, our collective and our cultural histories. Uh, wow. Uh, I will also let everyone know this. Uh, Vincent Fom, who is our TA for this evening, he is dropping resources uh, into the chat. But what we will do is, is the chat, the Q&A chat that we're using tonight, we will include that in the webinar resources tab. So we're going to download it as a CSV. So all of the comments, as well as the, the resource links that you all are sharing, they will be made available to you and you will have access to them once we are done, uh, you know, with the evening. Um, so again, just uh, thank you all so much. Uh, we're getting close to our, our closing time now. Um, it's right here at 830 Eastern time. But um, again, I've, I've uh, had moments of gratitude all evening, but this has been uh, an event, a webinar that I've truly been looking forward to. Hip hop is 50 this year. And so, yeah. uh, you know, we've seen across popular culture, um, our students have talked about it, but this is monumental. And so um, I am uh, truly thankful for Dr. Rawls and uh, I look forward to continuing to support his work. I'll encourage you all to uh, pick up a copy of YCP Youth Culture Power. Um, you know, definitely follow the work of JR, continue to support uh, Dr. Rawls. We've had uh, over a thousand registrants for the session tonight. And uh, even more will log in uh, on demand to hear more uh, about what he is doing. Um, he has let you all know that he is available uh, to you. So please reach out to him. I certainly plan on doing so. Uh, I'll encourage you all to uh, continue to follow the happenings at the National Humanities Center. There's so much that's going to be going on in the coming months. Just go to our website or check us out on various uh, social media platforms, including uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook uh, as well. So please feel free to check us out there. And uh, we would love to, uh, to continue to support you all in uh, your classrooms. I'll also say that uh, there are opportunities to support the humanities education programs as well. So if you look in the webinar resources chat, you will find that uh, available in that chat uh, is a link for you to, uh, to, to all support the continuing work that we are doing as a nonprofit institution. So uh, again, thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. And if I can assist you or help you all in the great work that you are doing, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you so much, and you all have a great night. Thank you, Dr. Rawls. I appreciate you. Thank you, and thank you to all of you. I appreciate your time and support. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Great questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I hope to I, see uh, some of you in a few.